Hey, good morning, Northwoods Online. Happy Sunday. My name's Hope. This is Amy, and we're excited to be welcoming you to Northwoods this weekend. And you know, we still have time. If there is someone you would like to invite to today's service, send them a text with the link to Northwoods Online. Or if you're on Facebook, you can just share the stream, and then people will see it in your newsfeed. And that is a great way to be inviting people to watch today's service. Yes, and after that, whether you're watching online or attending on one of our campuses, we would love for you to pull out your smartphone, get on the Northwoods app, and fill out the connection card. This is a great way for you to stay connected with us, for us to stay connected with you and know how to care for you and know who is here and involved in participating in our services. So we invite you to do that today. Also, for those of you who are watching online, be sure to say hi in the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from. You can interact throughout the message today with those of you who are attending online. You can also do things like request prayer. So we just encourage you to be involved there in the chat while you're here online. Yeah, for sure. And you know, I think that I saw Bruce the Moose. Yeah, Bruce the Moose is here from hey. Discovery Land. How are you, Bruce? <laughs> so fun. Do you have something for us? What oh is my goodness. That? This is exciting. Oh, so cool. Okay, it says Discovery Land to go. And oh my goodness. So it looks like there's all kinds of stuff in there. There's Play-Doh and candy. What else do we have? So in there? many fun things. There's prizes, there's a memory verse, there's family activities. This is awesome. Yeah. So these boxes are actually a, something that you and your family can get, and it brings Discovery Land home for you. Yes. I'm really excited about this as a parent. I have a couple of preschoolers. They love Discovery Land, they love watching Discovery Land online. But this is going to be such an incredible resource to reinforce what they're learning at home to be able to do some of the lessons and some of the games with them and just continue to encourage their spiritual growth. And what's great about it is it's designed for whether your kids are attending on a campus right now or if you're unable to be here in person, it's going to be great supplemental material for you to invest in your kids and for them to learn more about Jesus in this season. Yeah, it's really incredible. And I'm so excited to see how families are going to be using it. So if you would like to get the Discovery Land to Go box for for November, it is really important for you to register and sign up before October 22nd. And that link will show up on your screen. So just go there. It'll ask for all your information. If you need the box mailed to you, we can do that too. So be sure to go online and sign up for that. Yes, so thanks again for joining us this weekend. We are in the middle of our series called The Beatitudes for a Blessed Life. Pastor Cal is going to be bringing the word again this weekend. It's going to be great. We're excited to hear what God has put on his heart. So right now we're going to begin service with some worship. We'd love for you to turn up your speakers, sing out loud, and join us today. Good morning, Northwoods. Come on, would you stand to your feet wherever you're at? We're gonna give our love to Jesus this morning. Tell him how worthy he is. Come on, let's give him all our praise.
Lord, for loving us through all our failures. You're so good to us. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures in vain are never enough. Yeah. And you came along. Thank you, Lord. Put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, Lord, it's true, true. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness. My failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. the God of the valley, and there's a place your mercy and grace won't find me again, yeah, 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 sing it, no, there's nothing, sing it to the Lord, better than you, there's nothing, better than you, Lord, there's nothing, 
We give you the praise. You're the only one in whom we find all we need, all we could ever want, wrapped up in who you are, Jesus. We thank you today. The storm inside, it brings me to my knees. Nowhere to hide, this weight is crippling. Come speak to the sea. It's raging inside of me. All of this worry to you I will relieve. I cast my cares at your feet. Take it.
Father, thank you, thank you, thank you that you are a Father that loves us. You adore us. You sent your one and only Son as a sacrifice for us, for our sins, so that we could have eternity in heaven with you. God, you're amazing. You are worthy of all of our praise. You are a good, good Father. Lord, we invite you in today, Lord. Open our hearts, open our eyes. Help us, Lord, to see the fullness of your glory, Lord. Be here with us and draw us to you. And Lord, help us to walk every step of our day in the fullness of who you are and glorifying you only. And it's in your name we praise, amen. You may go ahead and be seated. Well, good morning. My name is Janine and welcome to Northwoods. We're so glad you're here today. We know that you have a lot of different things you could be doing with your time. So we're really glad you chose it to spend with us this morning. Well, before I go any further, would you mind taking a moment to pull out your phone, open up the Northwoods app and fill out the connection card. Now, if this is your first time with us, we would love for you to fill that card out too. So whether you're on one of our campuses, you're online for the first time, or maybe you're in a home with someone online, pull out that, your phone, download the Northwoods app, and fill out the connection card. This is such a great tool that helps us know that you're joining us today. But it also helps you to get information, Register for different events and classes that are going on around Northwoods, and there's a place for you to leave a prayer request. We have an incredible prayer team that would love to pray with you and for you. Well, as you know, Northwoods serves thousands of people every week, and all that kingdom work wouldn't be possible without your faithful prayers and financial support. So as the Lord leads you today, you can share your tithes and offerings at northwoods.church slash give. You can also drop off your cash or checks at any of our campus drop boxes. Now, first, give to the general fund. This helps resource all of our regular activities and groups and classes that are going on that we'd love for you to participate in. But it also helps resource our operating costs, like the utilities and lights, staff, and all the supplies that we use to help share with you guys. And then share your above and beyond offerings with the, those important ministries like Kingdom Surge and Missions. All right, so this year, our annual fall retreat for 7th through 12th grade is going to look, look a little bit different, just like just about everything this year, right? But 
it's still going to be the same fun and excitement that they've always had in the last several years. Converge is having the getaway homecoming on November 7th, and it's going to be hosted here on the Peoria campus. And it's going to be only $20. Now, parents, if you have teenagers, you know that's a really good price to get the kids, your teenager, out of the house for an entire day. And you can do it guilt-free because they're going to have a ton of fun playing group games, having activities, and taking in some incredible live worship and teaching. You can find out more about it by going to northwoods.church slash converge. Now, for those of you with younger kiddos, we have something exciting for you too. I'm sorry to say we're not taking your kids off of your hands for the day, but Discovery Land is offering what they're calling Discovery Land to-go boxes. Each month, families can subscribe to receive one of these incredible boxes. It's incredible tools here to help you walk your kids through their spiritual journey. There's different activities that you can do with the kids. It's all right here in the box. Games that even has M&Ms. My daughter would be all over this. I think she's back there going, ooh, ooh, are we going to have one? And then this right here is one of my favorite parts, the home front. This is for you parents to help you guide your kids on their spiritual journey. This is the most important job you'll ever have. So check out these boxes. All the materials are integrated with our online services, the videos, and they're made for big kids and little kids. And all of it is customized for your family's ages. So to get one of these, visit G-O-N-W dot C-C to go. Sounds a little bit different than most of our websites, right? So think of it like this. Go Northwoods, G-O-N-W dot C-C slash to go. And get your family engaged with one of these incredible Discovery Land to go boxes. And the first two months are free. All right, that's all I have for you today. So let's now prepare our hearts and our minds for what Pastor Cal has to share with us. Well, good morning, Northwoods. How you doing? Everybody good? Great to see you again today. Welcome to our online family and our other campuses. I'm glad to be with you today. Uh, Pastor John was originally supposed to teach today, but we switched out our weekends uh, with me taking this weekend, him taking next weekend, so that he could spend this week uh, being off with his wife, Michaela, in the aftermath of the birth of their new baby boy, Aaron Jonathan Rickner, who was born October 7th. My first grandson. And the Rickner name lives on. Awesome. And uh, that's to go along, first grandson, think of that, to go along with seven, soon to be eight granddaughters. Pray for that little guy, all right? You can have a lot of fun with those little girl cousins. But Aaron's got these long fingers and long toes. I think he's gonna be about six, eight. He's already under orders to dominate on the basketball floor. I've told him just, you know, dunk on people and then say, praise the Lord. That's, that's the appropriate meekness that we're talking about today. We are at part three today of our series, Be Attitudes to a Blessed Life, where we've been taking a look at the kind of qualities that Jesus said should mark the lives of those who claim to be his disciples. These are inner attitudes of the heart that bring forth the appropriate outer actions, behaviors, and responses, and thus lead to rich blessing, happiness, and fulfillment in our lives. As Jesus said with each one of these, blessed are those who... 
or oh, the happiness, oh, the fulfillment of those who pursue these qualities in their lives. The first week we looked at blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who know that they need outside help, that if I'm gonna become the person I need to be, I need God's grace, his forgiveness, his love in my life. And so I humbly depend on him for the life he offers me. When you come to that point, you begin to see him for who he is, then you recognize your own sin. And Nathan taught on this last week, blessed are those who mourn, the contrite in spirit, who understand that I have offended the heart of a holy God, I need his grace, and when we come to him in faith, he pours out that grace on us, and we are grateful to know his saving power in our lives because we're so aware of our own brokenness. Today we're looking at a third quality found in Matthew 5 and verse 5 where Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now at first glance it hardly makes sense because it's easy to assume the meek will inherit nothing but footprints up and down their backsides as they just let people walk all over them. Right? We associate meekness with weakness and who wants to be someone else's doormat? But that is hardly what this word means. The word Jesus used for meekness, praus, in the Greek text, far from being a picture of weakness, is actually a picture of thoughtful, selfless strength. It was used of a horse that had been domesticated so that now rather than wild and dangerous and really good for nothing because it can't be harnessed is now gentle and under control and useful to its master. Thus the word gentle or restrained gives the idea of what Jesus was referring to by meekness. In Matthew 11 and verse 29 Jesus, in referring to himself, said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am praus, I am meek. It's our word meek, translated here in the NIV, for I am gentle, the God of the universe with all power in his hand to destroy his enemies. He says, I'm not here to destroy anybody. I've come that you might have life. I am gentle and humble of heart. And if you'll take my yoke, if you'll get in the yoke with me, if you'll walk with me, you will find rest for your soul. So what was Jesus saying when he called himself meek? Was he saying, learn from me because I'm a wimp? And I want to teach you how to be a wimp as well? Hardly. Jesus was actually one of the strongest men to have ever lived. When it was time to flip the tables in the temple and confront the corrupt temple leaders, he did it. When it was time to speak truth to power and call the Pharisees and teachers of the law a brood of vipers, he did it. When it was time to submit to the Father's will and undergo a torturous beating and crucifixion that he might bring salvation to the world, he did it. Even though he had the power to completely destroy his enemies. In fact, through Jesus' example, we learn that meekness is the ability to combine or wed appropriate strength with appropriate restraint depending on the need of the moment for the well-being of those around us as opposed to one's own selfish interests. Or we should say taking that strength and that restraint and deferring to what the Holy Spirit is telling us in the moment. This was a picture of meekness as Jesus lived it out. Think of it first, it's power under control. Think of it as like a golfer who, who facing a 600 yard par five hole, pulls out his driver and smoothly and effortlessly uncorks a 340 yard drive off the tee. Appropriate strength. But then having chipped within 15 feet of the hole, you wouldn't, you wouldn't assume that he would pull out his driver again just to prove how much strength he has. 
That'd be absurd. No, from 15 feet. Now, that power under control, that restraint leads to a nice smooth putt because that's what's appropriate to the need of the moment. But it's the second part, laying down our own agenda or selfish interests for the well-being of those, of those around us that often causes meekness to be confused with weakness. We get, okay, appropriate strength, appropriate constraint, but as it relates to the needs of those around us. Was Jesus weak when he allowed himself to be crucified by his captors? Though he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free, the old hymn says. Was he weak? Not if you understand that in that moment he was exhibiting the amazing strength of fleshly restraint in order that he might submit to God's higher purpose. And likewise, the Holy Spirit will often call the true follower of Jesus to lay down his own individual rights and selfish concerns and submit in obedience to the Father when we might feel like lashing out and getting even with those who are mistreating us. That's true meekness, but it's not weakness. You tell me, what takes more strength? Lashing out in anger to get even and take revenge or showing restraint because the Holy Spirit has said, trust me. You see the strength inherent in not taking the action I could take to overpower the one that I feel like overpowering right now? And I get it. I know in my own heart that tendency to want to fight back and get even. That's why I smiled when I heard about the trucker who, while enjoying a quiet dinner in an old rundown western truck stop one night, was descended upon by a group of about 12 Hell's Angel cyclists who pulled up on their ear-busting, souped-up motorcycles. And one of the ringleaders spotted the truck driver, just wanted to cause a little trouble without provocation, walked over, picked up his plate of spaghetti, and just smashed it on this guy's head. Then he took the truck driver's beer and poured it in his lap, slapped him around a little bit, said, come on, big boy, let's see how much of a man you really are. I mean, he just stripped him of his dignity and manhood right there in front of everyone. And incredibly, the truck driver didn't do anything. He just silently got up, walked over to the cash register, paid his bill, and walked out. And this big guy for the Hell's Angel looked over at the bartender and said, not much of a man, is he? At which point, the bartender said no, and not much of a truck driver either because he just ran over 12 choppers on his way out of the parking lot. <laughs> and I, there's something about that that feels good, doesn't it? Come on, let's just admit it. And the world applauds that kind of mentality. That's why it takes the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit to domesticate us, to turn us into gentle followers of Jesus who are willing to lay down our right to get even, to defend ourselves, and to believe that we'll still get to where we're going even if we didn't scratch and claw and run over everyone in our way in order to get there. Oh, I know, it's easy to believe. Well, one pastor said, even if the meek do inherit the earth, some bully will just take it away from them again, right? And so we're ready to fight. I don't know if you recognize in your own self, we were born into this world ready to fight. I think I learned it somewhere very early in my life, maybe the sandbox. I discovered the rules for getting ahead in life. Rule number one, what's mine is mine, and I've got a right to keep it. I love rule number two, what's thine is mine, and I've got a right to take it. And then rule number three is if you don't like one and two, rather than calm reason, bodily threat always works better. Want to fight about it? See? And then number four, um, never settle for getting even when you can get ahead. Wisdom from the sandbox. No one ever taught me those rules. I figured them out on my own. And I'm just betting that you probably figured those out as well. I discovered somewhere in the sandbox that it's always easier to fight back than to step back when it's time to fight. 
I distinctly remember the day at school during a fifth grade recess when my sandbox wisdom took over in the fall. And this was probably late October, early November, but at recess we would play in the park, Ruley Park, which was set across the, the road from our elementary school. And some of us guys would always divide up, play football. And on this particular day, it was rather cold outside. So when my good friend Terry Yoder happened to unintentionally slap me in the face while I was carrying the ball, it stung and I got mad. And there was no ill will on his part, but had there been, and I was acting with meekness, I might have stepped back, but no, 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 no. Not from my sandbox wisdom. I went charging towards him, totally out of control, wanting to smack him as well, and he ducked as I was coming, and I flipped right over him. You talk about the Wiley Coyote cartoon? I was Wiley Coyote, who, trying to get ahead, ends up just looking like an idiot. But now I'm really mad. And so getting back up, this time making sure I went at, went at him with a little more control, I swung, and I mean, I slapped him hard and cleanly right across the face and was like, there, how'd that feel? How'd you like it? And while I can still recall the hurt look in his eyes, what I remember most is what happened in my heart after I'd gotten even. Rather than feeling good about it, I felt absolutely rotten. I mean, the sting of his slap to my face was nothing compared to the sting in my heart for the cruelty with which I had just attacked a friend. And that day stands out in my mind because it was the first time I remember hearing the faint whispers of my heart offering me another way besides my sandbox wisdom. I realize now the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. I can tell you I would have felt a whole lot better that day if I had just taken that slap without retaliating. I learned that day that getting even isn't always what it's cracked up to be. And I'm asking you, have you learned that yet? Have you discovered that when you have to claw and fight and scratch and maim someone else in order to get everything you want, it doesn't usually lead to the happiness you thought it might? And Jesus says to us today through this incredible and certainly the most misunderstood of these eight beatitudes to a blessed life. He says the way to get the most out of life and discover true fulfillment in the process is not by grabbing for everything you want. It's not in beating people up, putting people down, raking people over, taking people under, chewing people up, spitting people out. The way to experience true happiness in your life, the way to inherit everything God wants to give you is by cultivating meekness in your life. This, this gentle, power, under control attitude. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So the question is, how do we cooperate with the Holy Spirit to develop these quality, this quality in our lives? And I want to give you six practices today, any and all of which can help us develop the strength and meekness in our lives. So you just, as you're listening, you say, Holy Spirit, where do I start? He probably has one that he wants to pick out for you. But these spell, I'm going to use a little acrostic that spells strong because I want you to understand that meekness is anything but weakness. This is strength in the power of the Holy Spirit to defer to the Lord in that moment when you want to lash out in your own strength. Let's look. At lesson number one, or practice number one, is the practice of selflessness. This is the S to, to being strong. The practice of selflessness. It's the spirit of Philippians 2 and verse 4, which says, Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. This doesn't mean you don't have needs and interests. It doesn't mean that you neglect your own needs and interests. It just means that your first concern in any situation is not with making sure you win at the other guy's expense. It simply means in keeping the peace sometimes, in thinking win-win, you may have to defer to the other person at times. And it's okay if you're trusting God, you still will inherit what he wants to give you. Think Abraham and Lot. We could take you back there, but you read it sometimes. Genesis 13. In the Old Testament, Moses was called the meekest man on earth, but Abraham also displayed this quality right here in Genesis 13. So he, he, he had 
taken in Lot when Lot's parents had died and Lot's his nephew. And as they began to grow and prosper, it soon became tough for their all of their possessions to dwell under one place in the land. They were, their workers were arguing with each other and Abraham finally said, let's not have any of this among us. He said, look, there's plenty of land here. I'm gonna let you choose where you wanna live. He says, if you go right, I'll go left. You go left, I'll go right. But I'm gonna let you choose. Now that took real meekness. Lot, you get first dibs. Lot looks at the land, he sees what he thinks is the best, and he grabs it for himself. Abraham doesn't make a big deal about it. He heads off to what's left, and God says to him what he says to us when we are operating under the power of the Holy Spirit. He said, Abraham, don't worry about it, because it's all going to belong to you one day. But he defers in that moment. Understand, meekness is not about allowing someone to get away with a glaring injustice, though sometimes injustice will be done to us. There's nothing we can do about it. We learn to defer in love to the Holy Spirit even when injustice is done. But really, this is just that in any given situation, even in situations with friends or with family, someone has to go first. And if you're meek, you prefer, you would, you would rather def, defer to make them happy than insist on your own right and make the other unhappy when there was a way for you both to be happy. It's thinking win-win, even if it means letting the other person go first. It's, it's trusting God enough to know that, listen to me, it's trusting God enough to know that when you defer in love, you never lose. Do you believe that? I love the story of the mom who's making pancakes for breakfast for her little boys one morning. Jimmy seven and Billy five. And as she set the pancakes in front of them, it was obvious that one of the pancakes was much bigger than the other. And Jimmy, being older, immediately grabbed the bigger one for himself. The mother, wanting to teach Jimmy how to think of others first, simply said, now, Jimmy, what do you think Jesus would have done with the bigger pancake? Do you think he would have grabbed it for himself or offered it to Billy? With the application slowly sinking in, Jimmy pushed the big pancake across the table to his younger brother and said, here, Billy, now you be Jesus. <laughs> I love that. One way or another, I'm gonna get the big one, right? I love that because that's just like us. But when you think meekness, don't think, here's what I'm saying, don't think injustice, just think deference. I don't always, ha I don't always have to be first. I, I don't always have to have my way. And guys, I'm telling you with this practice, listen, there is probably gonna be a time this week where you're in a situation and you get the opportunity to let somebody else have the biggest pancake. Meekness begins with this practice of selflessness. Now, I want to add quickly to this a second practice, and that is the practice of trust. This is the T in strong. The only way you will ever learn to graciously defer to others instead of grabbing for yourself first is if you really trust what God says about his inheritance plan for you. Do you trust? Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Do you believe that if you follow God and he asks you to defer or he asks you to step back, that you'll still get what he wants to give you? I want to give you a couple of faith declarations to pray and speak over your life, particularly when you've been wronged by others or you're making a decision not to fight back. Let these be foundational beliefs in your life because they are foundational to meekness. You cannot practice meekness if you don't believe these. First faith declaration, the Lord is near. And I love this one because look, look at what it says. Philippians 4 and verse 5 says, 
Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Have you ever stopped to think, what in the world does my gentleness have to do with God being near? Once you start thinking meekness, you go, okay, I get it. See, if I know God is near, and if I know that he sees, and he knows what's going on, I don't have to get all worked up about what seems not to be working out in my favor right now. The Lord is near, and so I can stay in a place of gentleness, of power under control, because I'm trusting him to bring about my inheritance. You see it? The Lord is near. Here's the second one. Better have this faith declaration in your arsenal. If you're, if you're gonna practice meekness, the Lord is directing my life. Proverbs Proverb 16, nine says, in his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. And so if the Lord is directing my steps and I'm trusting him, I know that no matter what happens, I'm gonna get in on my, the inheritance he wants me to have. I don't, I don't have to grab and fight and make sure I'm, I'm first. And here's a third one. The Lord will fulfill his purposes for me no matter what happens. Psalm 138 verse 8 says it this way. The Lord will fulfill his purposes for me. Do you believe that? Which means that when someone else looks like they're trying to cut in on your purpose, guys, nobody else can keep you from fulfilling God's purpose for you. The only person can keep you from fulfilling God's purpose is you. And that's you giving up on God's purpose. Nobody else can keep you from fulfilling God's purpose. And he will fulfill his purpose for you. But that means you just have to stay in faith and trust God to work out his purposes when it looks like you're getting the short end of the stick. Here's the fourth faith declaration. I will inherit what God has for me. You believe that? So someone has done you wrong, cheated you out of what was yours, you want so badly to fight back, take them down, make them suffer, and God is saying, no, 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 you continue to do good and trust me. Well, God, how will I get the situation rectified? I will rectify it. Look at what he says in Hebrews 10, verses 35 and 36, to those who were being persecuted for their faith, first century Christians, who to come to Jesus, now they get all of their possessions taken away from them, they get mistreated, and I'm sure they want to stand up and fight. Look what the writer of Hebrews says to them, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You're not going to lose God's inheritance. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, guys, whether it's going good or going bad, you just keep doing the will of God. Why? Because when you've done the will of God, you will receive what God has promised. Do you believe that? Do you trust that? And if you trust that, then you're going to be able to work with the Holy Spirit to, to, uh, to allow him to birth meekness in your heart when you want to stand up and fight for everything you think should be coming to you. Selflessness. Trust. Practice number three is the practice. Here's the R. It's the practice of restraint. Again, meekness is not weakness. And sometimes I am asked to use my strength to help others who are being oppressed. In this case, I rise up in my anger. Anger can actually be a good thing, though most of us, you know, it probably hasn't been. But if it moves me to appropriate action, with appropriate strength and appropriate restraint, not out of hate for the one doing the evil, not in order to hurt the one doing the evil, but in order to restrain the evil that is being done. Guys, that's a part of meekness. It's Jesus turning over the tables in the temple when that is the appropriate response. It's power under control. 
Think of our ministry partners in India as they rescue these precious girls from the horrors of sex trafficking. Meekness should move one to anger over this injustice and cruelty, but rather than doing nothing out of fear for our own comfort on one hand, and rather than lashing out in hatred towards the people who are doing this on the other hand, true meekness would make use of every resource in one's power, both to restrain the offenders and to rescue the the victims in an effort to bring about a redemptive solution to this evil. And you now see why it takes the power of the Holy Spirit so I can walk in that balance with a good heart, but exude the strength I need to be a restrainer of evil. This is when the, the, the big fight breaks out in the baseball field. You're not the one who started the fight. You're the one who's trying to pull people off the pile. Get this thing back under control. But you engage. Well, no, no, no. My mommy taught me not to fight, so I gotta sit over here and do nothing. That's not meekness. Last week, I did a, a wedding in Knoxville, Tennessee for a friend of mine. And while there, I met an ex-con named Robert Gibson who went to prison at the age of 16. I said, Robert, I didn't know they put 16-year-olds in prison. He said, that's where I deserve to be. I was a wicked, wicked, evil, sinful man who deserved everything I ever got and more. He was given a 99-year sentence. He served 36 years of that sentence and about 14, 15 years ago, they came to him. He was gloriously saved in prison. And he just said, I'm gonna serve the Lord. I'm gonna, you know, he just went everywhere in that prison trying to reach people for Jesus after his life had been changed. But he said, I never dreamed of getting out. I never prayed to get out. I never hoped to get out. There was no, I, I, I was in for the rest of my life, but it's okay, my life belongs to Jesus. I just wanna serve him. They came to him about 15 years ago and said, Robbie, uh, this, this place isn't gonna help you anymore. You're free to go. So now he's out today traveling all over the country to churches and prisons, sharing about how God's power and God's grace can change the most wicked heart. I had, a, yeah, it's awesome. I want, you to, I want you to meet him in person someday, I hope, but I brought along just a little video clip that you might get to know Robert a little bit here today. When I first came in those big steel doors out there, I thought to myself, what have I done? And I literally thought I would die right here at Brushy Mountain Prison. I was wicked, had a wicked heart, wicked mind, wicked thoughts. You see those vents back there? We would take those vents off and make homemade knives out of them. This institution here is the worst place on earth. They perpetrating murders up here. You've got people with 150 years. You got That's Gibson in 1978 from a WBIR story he never saw in prison until now. Wow. Ain't that so? I don't... <laughs> Hey, now some of these guys right here, and I'm telling you some dangerous guys now, buddy. I love the way he talks, too. We had, we had such a great time together. You know, he, and, and this is just one of those off the cuff where he goes, you know, the Bible says what's in the well is going to come out in the cup. And if what's in the cup isn't good, that means the well isn't good. And I'm like, amen, brother. That's pretty good, you know. But anyway, I, I share a little of his story today to say in the moment he gave me what I would call a picture of meekness that most of us would say, wow, I've never seen that before as meekness. So here he is driving down the road one day and he picks up a hitchhiker. I don't know that long ago. And uh, Robert will tell you, if you've been in prison as long as he has, you know evil, you feel evil, you smell evil, you sense evil when, when you know you're in the presence of evil. And that's what he felt as he picked this guy up and he got in the truck that he said, I could tell the guy was strung out on drugs. As he laid down his backpack, there was a sheath right on top with a nice long knife in it. Said, so I just kind of kept my eye on him, but I started sharing Jesus with him as we went down the road, telling him about how Jesus had changed my heart, saying, I can tell you are exactly where I used to be, and uh, I want you to know that if Jesus Christ could change my heart, he can change yours. He stopped, got him something to eat at McDonald's, and then gave him the change from a 20, got back in the truck and kept going, but he said, I could tell that he was, uh, he, he was wanting to use that knife. 
And I just, as I'm driving, I just looked over at him and said, you don't want to do that, okay? I know what you're thinking. I know what you're gonna try to do, but I'm just telling you right now, you don't want to do that. This guy rears back and goes, oh yeah! You know, and, and he's kind of out of his head anyway. And he said, no, you really don't. You need to let Jesus Christ change your life like he changed mine. Well, at that point, this guy goes for his knife and Robbie, just driving along, wham! Got him right here in the Larnix. He knows how to hit people to restrain them. And that guy's sitting there going, ah, ah, ah. he said, I wasn't trying to hurt him. I wasn't trying to kill him. I was trying to restrain him. But since this guy would not receive my help, he said, I stopped. I went around the other side of the truck. I got him out, make sure he was breathing. Everything's good. He said, I don't need another murder on my, you know, my record or whatever. He's good. He said, I left him there in the ditch. I gave him his stuff. I gave him another two $20 bills. And then I prayed over him before I got back in the truck and took off. Now, I want, you, I want you to understand something, friends. The old, undomesticated Robert would have simply killed that guy and threw him in the ditch. The born-again Robert first warned him kindly and then restrained him without attempting to maim him permanently. You understand? He, he took appropriate action against evil. It was power under control in that moment with a good heart that went on its way praying for that man be, to be delivered from his evil. See, it was the ability to restrain wickedness with appropriate force while still caring about the one doing it. That's what we're talking about. You can understand why this takes a real work uh, of power of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we walk in that blended balance. And how much more so if you were carrying some kids who weren't uh, able to help themselves while they're in that truck as well, and this guy wants to use the knife on them. Should you just sit down in weakness and say, well, the Lord said be meek, and let's just let him carve us up? Or should you restrain the evil, doing your best to be a restrainer without hate and without wounding, the, the, you know, without permanently maiming the person who's trying to bring the evil against you. Understand, it takes the power of the Holy Spirit for us to walk in this balance and to know the appropriate response in the moment. Strength and restraint for the well-being of others as the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Now, here's practice number four. The, uh, the, the practice of other-centeredness is the O in strong. So you got selflessness, you've got trust, you've got restraint, you've got other-centeredness. And this is a lot like the first one where I said selflessness, but this just really puts the emphasis upon how can I serve others. It's kind of like, God, make me as concerned to see others inherit what is theirs as I am to get my own. And so you start living to see others come into their inheritance with God. And it, and it makes no difference who they are, be they down and outers or up and outers. Romans 12, 16 says, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. For the truly meek person, no person, and no assignment is beneath them. When the Holy Spirit says there's a need I want you to meet, that person We'll just do it with joy because the Holy Spirit has worked meekness in their lives. I remembered while I was putting together this message, a book I read years ago by Jim Simbola, author and pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle, Tabernacle Church in New York, an amazing church. There's a little book out called The Life God Blesses, and I've never forgotten the story and was able to just kind of like turn right there in the book to find it again. He's in the Philippines one day, and he's talking with a pastor how the name came up. It was somebody that Jim had really respected, an older pastor named Howard Goss, who was a tremendous communicator and leader in his own day. And he mentioned Howard Goss, and this pastor said, his son is in my church. And, and uh, Howard was now dead, and, and Jim was thinking, his son is in your church? And so they made arrangements for for Jim to have the opportunity to meet this guy's son. And while they were together, the son told Jim the story of how he had gotten away from Jesus and a powerful story of the, the, the father's and mother's prayers for him that brought him back. But he said, it was also the beauty of the way my dad lived his life that had just put seeds in me I could not stay away from. And he told him the story, and this is the one that fascinated it's way into my heart way back when I read it. 
The son is talking about a day when he was seven years old. This is many years later. But at seven, they would go to these great big campground conventions. His dad being this famous preacher and everything. And there would be these week-long revival meetings. And his dad was always one of the big speakers at the meetings. And he said many, many times they were famous guys. And they would all kind of dicker to, you know, they all wanted the meeting that would have the most people, which were usually the evenings. So there was the morning slots, there was noon slots, there were evening slots, and the biggest and the best always wanted the evening since that was gonna be when the biggest crowd was there. So they're putting the schedule together. The little seven-year-old is sitting in the room and they say, Howard Goss, where do, where do you wanna be on the docket? And there's no Howard. They said, where's Howard? Somebody said, I don't know, last time I saw him, he was up by the kitchen. So one of the pastors took Howard's seven-year-old boy and they made their way over to the kitchen and could not believe their eyes when they got there. Howard Goss, this great communicator of the word of God, was down on his hands and knees cleaning the kitchen floor along with the kitchen workers. Seven-year-old never forgot it. But he remembers this pastor going, Howard, what are you doing down there on your hands and knees? We're putting together the preaching schedule right now. And Howard, without batting an eye, just said, oh, you know what? You've got so many wonderful preachers here this week. You don't really need to worry about me. He said, I just saw that there was a need here in the kitchen. So I thought I would come and help them out here. You want to talk about meekness? That's meekness. It's saying, God, if you need me for kitchen duty, I'll do kitchen duty. No one and nothing is beneath me. You want me to serve? I'm going to serve you. It's an other centeredness that says, Lord, where do you need me right now? I'll help. Wow. God, make me like Howard Goss. Here's practice number five. The practice of our N. Niceness. Do you know as a Christian that it, it, it's still okay to be nice? You can, you can be kind, even when you're firm. I didn't put this one up today, but Proverbs 15, one, think about this. It says, a soft answer turns away wrath, while harsh words stir up anger. How many of you have lived that one, right? I know what it is to be harsh and just stir it up. Lord, would you make me a little more kind? a little more soft, a little more tender-hearted. You know that is part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. In fact, look at this first part of Ephesians 4.32. It says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted. That's talking about caring, kindness, niceness in your heart. Tender-hearted. We'll go on to the rest of that verse in a little bit, but I want to stop there for a minute. Tender-hearted. Are you, are, are you known as being tenderhearted? Are you nice to people? Or are you harsh? First guy to ever come to Christ in my first ministry, one of the greatest, I, I, I mean, I'd been praying. I wanted to see it early right out of the gate, and God let me see it early right out of the gate. I'm just a young pastor, and on a Sunday night, we had... Sunday morning service, Sunday night services, and on a Sunday night, our lights went out at church, ended the service. <laughs> I found out on Thursday, the next Thursday, why our lights went out, when a young man named Tony Leak was in my office. He had run his car while he was drunk into a utility pole that carried our lights and knocked out our lights. It was his third DUI in a year. This young man was a sharp guy, college educated, but he was in trouble, and he was in bondage to alcohol. And I want to tell you, Jesus Christ gloriously saved him. And my office is still special to me. I still have contact with him once in a while. Tony, his life was radically changed. A few weeks later, while sitting in church one Sunday night, 
We had a, uh, can you believe this? We had a gospel quartet for about 20 or 25 minutes. Only this wasn't one of the professional groups. This was a group of old guys in the community that pretty well known. And so we were, we were using them for the first 25, 30 minutes of that, uh, of that service. I know you guys find it hard to believe that Cal would have a gospel quartet in church, but we did. And they were introducing themselves and most everybody knew, knew who they were because these were business guys from town. But Tony was sitting there as the high tenor named Herm introduced himself. Tony is going, no way. No way. I can't believe it. He's like, he's like under his breath to me going, I can't believe it. Not Herm. And I finally said, Tony, what, what are you talking about? He said, Cal. He said, Herm is my next door neighbor. And I had no idea that he was a follower of Jesus. He said, the only time he's ever talked to me is when he came out the back door to scream at me when I've been cleaning up the yard the morning after one of my late night drinking parties. He says, I'm glad, I'm glad he's a Christian. I just didn't know he was or wouldn't have thought he was. And I'm sitting there feeling really badly for Herm at that point. And I'm, I'm wishing that I could have taken him, uh, taken him aside sooner and, and said, uh, Herm, uh, would it have been much better in this moment had you gone over to help Tony clean up, maybe gotten to know him and, and, and said, you know, out of that context, you probably would have the opportunity to say, hey, you know, as neighbors, we got to really appreciate boundaries and, you know, I've been bothered a little bit by the beer cans and this type of thing, but I also want you to know that I'm a follower of Jesus. And man, if I can help you in any way, I'd love to help you. Just know I'm here for you. I pray for you, you know, this type of thing. How, 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 how much more of a testimony would have that been when Herm introduces himself that night rather than, I can't believe it, I would never have thought that he was a believer. Guys, here's, here's what I want to say to you. You can, you can be kind. And you can be nice. Even if sometimes you have to speak hard truth. Screaming at someone who doesn't yet know Jesus will probably not be the most effective way of bringing them to Christ. Even with God, look at this, Romans 2 and verse 4 says, God's kindness leads you to repentance. You know what that's saying? God didn't open the back door of heaven and yell at you to get you straightened up. No, in kindness, he came to where you were and offered you the help and the grace that you needed. And it was his kindness that led you to repentance. I kind of think that that's probably how it will be with other people. It'll be our kindness. One more. Here's the G in strong. Practice grace giving. Ephesians 4 verse 32, finish up that verse. Be kind to one another. There's, be nice. Tender hearted. But it didn't stop there. Look what it says. Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Let me ask you something. Do you treat other people with the same grace with which God has treated you. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. Meek people lead with grace because they realize how much grace they've been shown. They forgive because they realize, as Nathan shared last week, down on their own knees, broken before God, look at my sin, look what this has done to me. And how I've wounded your heart. They, they're not focused on everybody else's sin. I, I, I forgive because I realize how much I've been forgiven. They, they give because they realize how much they've been given. So my question is, who could use a little grace from you this week? 
Whom do you need to forgive? Listen, you, you won't lose your inheritance as you learn to lead with grace. You won't lose your inheritance if you learn to walk in the strength of true meekness. You, you will give God a chance to bless your life and show you favor because you trusted him. When he said step back, you step back. When he said step in, you stepped in. But always with appropriate strength and appropriate restraint. Looking out for how I can bless others. I smile when I remember this story. Some of you may remember it. I shared it a few years ago. It just happened a couple of years ago when I was headed down to pick up a Chick-fil-A sandwich one day. And you remember down there by the mall as you're, you know, as you're, you're uh, trying to get to Chick-fil-A, there are two lanes that will turn to the left and then you swing into Chick-fil-A, right? And I would always, when I get there, I'm always on the outside lane because I know if I'm gonna turn now, I'm gonna be on the inside lane to get into Chick-fil-A. And I'm sitting there, I don't know if you've ever done this, but I do this once in a while. I'm sitting there when this lady in a blue minivan with some kids comes pulling up next to me and I'm thinking, uh, I'll bet as soon as we turn, you're gonna try to cut over in front of me and get into Chick-fil-A first, but honey, you're not getting in first because I'm not letting you in. Now, I'm, I'm just sitting that, you know, I'm just thinking that as I'm sitting there in the van, right? You, now, come on, you've done that before. Dude, you're not getting in front of me, right? So light turns, I turn, sure enough, first thing happens, the lady in the minivan turns her turning signal on, wants to get in front, and I'm like, no, 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 you're going behind me. So uh, we, we pull into Chick-fil-A, sure enough, she follows me right into Chick-fil-A, and then you've got the big, uh, the, the $100 question, which line is gonna be moving fastest, right? Because I see, oh, it's shorter to go over here into the second line, lady in the minivan pulls into the first line. Now I'm sitting there thinking, wouldn't this be just my luck if today I get behind some slow poke, and even though I beat her into Chick-fil-A, she's gonna beat me out to the window right? And do you know, I got behind, behind somebody that I think was ordering for the whole town that day. It's like, come on, come on, come on, right? But I place my order and just as I'm pulling out, guess who pulls in front of me? Yes, Miss Lady in the minivan. And now by this time I'm laughing, I go, Kelly, you idiot, stop these crazy mind games. It's not a big deal, you know. She pulls up to the window, uh, pays for her order, takes off. I pull up to the window. The lady hands me the bag and says, there you go. It's all taken care of. I said, what do you mean it's all taken care of? I said, who paid for it? She said, well, that lady in the minivan in front of you paid for it. <laughs> now I've got a couple things going on in my heart. First, I'm really contrite because I'm thinking, oh my goodness, if she'd known the games I was playing in my mind, she would have stuck me with the bill rather than pay for mine, right? And I'm like, I should drive after her, fall at her feet and go, I'm unworthy if you only knew. <laughs> but in that moment, listen, same thing. God was speaking. And I swear, I know he was laughing while he was talking. And he was like, Cal, I was trying really hard to bless you today, but you were making it real difficult by having to be number one in line. And so guys, I say today, cultivate meekness in your life. Don't play the selfish, got to be first in line games. And even when someone cuts in front of you, as they inevitably will, let it go. Defer in love. Because if you respond rightly, God will often turn it into a blessing. But beyond that, just remember this. It's a life lesson. There's an inheritance coming up ahead that will rectify any injustices that came your way while you are simply seeking to live in meekness before God. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth and even sometimes get a free Chick-fil-A sandwich thrown in <laughs> with it. Amen? Come on, let's stand together. I want to pray for you today. And so, Father, we say thank you for your truth Every one of us, truly, when our hearts get a hold of this, it's like, God, I, I really want to be like you. I really want to be like you, Jesus. And at the same time, we recognize the difficulty if it's up to us to produce this ourselves. Lord, we need the power of your Holy Spirit. 
Yes, making us poor in spirit, dependent upon you, contrite in heart, recognizing our own brokenness, and then bringing that heart before you and saying, oh God, work in me through the power of your Holy Spirit, the meekness, the beauty of that restrained strength that was so evident in Jesus that he could easily put others ahead of himself. He could easily step into situations. He could say what needed to be said. He could do what needed to be done. And he would do it with love in his heart and always deferring to the Father. Help us, Lord, to be those who demonstrate the power and the beauty of meekness. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said... Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for being here today. Have a great week. If you need prayer for anything, come on down and the prayer team will be here with you. Those of you watching online today, thank you so much for joining us. And I pray that God spoke into your heart. Pray that you bring your heart before him even this week and say, Lord, I want, I want the beauty of this, this gentle power under control called meekness through the power of your Holy Spirit. Help me to show that. God bless you. Have a great week and we'll see you next weekend.